Thank you, church, for allowing me to come, and thank you for being in Sunday school. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of 2 Peter. The book of 2 Peter. I want you to look at a list that's found in the Word of God. And when you search the scriptures, the Bible is full of great lists that God put together. And if you ask people, name what you think would be the most important lists in the Bible, people probably say, well, the Ten Commandments, that's a list. And other lists. But this list has a special emphasis on it. And I love to preach from this passage of scripture because many great preachers, Charles Haddon Spurgeon and I love the stories of how uh, Moody and others thought that this list was so critical that they required their preacher boys to memorize it. Uh, Lester Roloff, how many of you remember the name Lester Roloff, anybody? Uh, he required all of his staff members to memorize this list and recite it once a day in unison. It's a list of seven things that God says, I'm going to command you to add to your faith. Now, no one will add these seven things by accident. When we read the list, you won't say, well, boy, I was doing that, didn't even realize it. No, 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 these are all distinctive things. And God says, I want you to add them. And then he gives this warning. He says, if you don't add them, you'll be blind. Now, that's written to Christians. You'll be a blind Christian as you navigate life. But he says, if you do add them, they'll make you what God wants you to be. Let's get ready to read the list of seven things, and then we'll go through it. Verse 1, Simon Peter, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Uh, we are absolutely saved by the grace of God. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Remember, you cannot live the Christian life in your ability or your power. It has to be done by divine power. Jesus said, without me, ye can do nothing whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, now here comes the list, giving all diligence. What a statement. When is the last time you gave God all diligence? On anything. Note he doesn't say much diligence. He doesn't say great diligence. He said, this list is so critical to the Lord that I'm commanding all diligence. Now, we demand diligence in life just among ourselves. How many of you here have ever gone to the hospital for an operation? Hold your hand up, would you? Uh, the day the doctor operated on you, just how diligent did you want him to be? Oh, you see, the day they operated on me, I wanted all diligence. Can you imagine if the doctor walked in the surgery suite, looked at you and said, don't really much feel like I'm up to this today, not even really sure I want to do it, but let's just take a half a stab at it and see what happens you'd be instantly healed and out of there because you demand diligence. Every time you get on an airplane, you want those pilots to exercise all diligence. Now we come to God, and God says, you're my child, but there's seven things I want you to put a special emphasis on in adding them to your life. And I want you to do it with all diligence. Now, please listen here. This list 
is what I call a cumulative list. You say, Brother Gibbs, what do you mean by that? God's going to command seven things. But he says, I want you to add the first one. And then to the first one, I want you to add the second one. And to the first two, I want you to add the third one. So you got to start with the first one. Don't start down in the list. Because God says, I'm not just listing these. I'm putting a priority on their order. Now look at what it says. And beside this, add to your faith, here's number one, virtue. Virtue. You say, Brother Gibbs, what is virtue? It's an inner integrity an inner rightness, an inner strength. No one has that by accident. We were just discussing a few moments ago uh, the precious mother uh, of your pastor's wife, and what a virtuous lady. You can't hide virtue. You say, well, I'm virtuous, it just doesn't show. No, no, no. Virtue, especially in this culture, absolutely stands out. It's an inner integrity. It's an inner strength. It's an inner rightness. And if someone were to walk around with me for a week, would they say, uh, David Gibbs is virtuous? If I were to walk around with you, you'll never have it by accident. Would they say, now there's a man of inner integrity. There's a lady who is virtuous. The 31st Psalm talks about the virtuous woman. God says, I'm commanding you to have that. It's the first thing with all diligence. I had a lady change my life. I was in Texas and the pastor picked me up at an airport. And the preacher said, Brother Gibbs, I'm way across town from the church. I said, I know that. And he said, I've got a lady in the hospital over here. Would you mind if I stopped and made a call and visited her real quick? I said, oh, no, sure. And he said, maybe you'd like to come in with me and visit with her. I said, preacher, I, I'll be glad to go in the hospital with you. I'll be glad to sit in the waiting room and pray. But I, I'm just not real comfortable seeing women in the hospital that I'm not familiar with. He said, well, I understand. But he said, let me tell you her story. He said, Brother Gibbs, she and her husband are just two of the best members in our church that we've ever, ever had. They have three beautiful kids. Uh, she sings in the choir and teaches Sunday school. Her husband is one of our deacons and an usher. And he said, I mean, you talk about great people. When the church doors are open, they're there. Boy, when we need volunteers, their hands go up before they know what we're volunteering for. They're just great, great people. He said, well, a year ago, they were in church with their three small kids. And I still remember Sunday night saying goodbye to them as they left, got their kids all buckled up and left the church parking lot. At quarter to six in the morning, her husband is at work. He drives a semi. He delivers building materials to construction sites. And he said, Brother Gibbs, he pulled his semi up at his first delivery stop and his semi was in line with other semis. And he's sitting in the cab of his truck, drinking a cup of coffee, and he has his Bible on the steering wheel. He said, they're transferring steel I-beams overhead. And he said, a cable snapped. He said, a beam that weighed 40 tons, 80,000 pounds, started a deadly journey back to Earth. Brother Gibbs had hit right over the top of the cab of his truck. But Brother Gibbs, it didn't hit sideways. It hit standing on end right over his head. In a second, it took his body and drove it through the bottom of the truck, through the concrete underneath the truck, and put his remains five feet in the dirt underneath. They were in Sunday school and in church like every Sunday. But Monday morning, he was in eternity. Now, can I remind you, one Sunday will be your last one. 
and very likely you will not know when it's going to be. That's why I tell everybody, boy, when you come to church, sing like it's your last time. Pray like it's your last time. Listen with the intensity that this is the last time. He said, Brother Gibbs, we had his funeral. She stood there with those three little kids. He said, 30 days to the day from when we buried her husband, her mom and dad, who are her only family, were coming across the state of Georgia at night. And Brother Gibbs, a drunkard, got on the road on the wrong side and unthinkably hit her mom and dad head on and killed them. Now, Brother Gibbs, she has no other family. So we buried her husband, and 30 days later, we buried her mother and father. She stayed absolutely faithful. She'd sing in the choir and tears would come down her cheeks because heaven got real dear to her. He said, six months later, she came to me and said, Preacher, I don't know how to tell you this, but I'm having really bad headaches. Sometimes when you're up there preaching and I'm in the choir, I, I just can't hardly see you. My head hurts so bad. And he said, I told her, Mary, it's all the incredible stress you're under. I'm sure it's okay, but let's go to the big clinic. And he said, we, we went to Mayo. And he said, Brother Gibbs, what they found out is she has cancer of the lining of the brain. Now, they've operated twice. But barring a miracle, she's only got a few days. And Brother Gibbs, she has no one to take those three kids. Nobody. Would you like to come in and just pray with her? I said, oh boy, I can't imagine what this lady's gone through. Brother Willette, I know you've been there. I walked in, I had my Bible in my hand, and I'm thinking, God, you've got to give me something. I don't know what to say to this precious lady. We found her room, and when we went in, mercy was she sick. She was in intensive care. Tubes were in her body everywhere. Her hair was all gone, and you could see two huge incision marks where they'd operated. Part of her scalp was still lifted back. I'll never forget her eyes. You couldn't take black paint and paint her eyes any darker. As we walked in, I noticed there's nothing in the room, just one picture on the tray table by her bed. As I walked up and looked at it, it's a picture of her three kids who she's going to leave now. Her pastor walked up and touched her hand. And when she opened her eyes, her face lit up. She said, oh, pastor, pastor, I'm so glad you got here. And we could hardly hear for all the tubes they had down her throat. And so we're leaning over her, listening. She said, I'm so glad you got here. I got something I gotta tell you. He said, Mary, what is it you gotta tell me? She said, Pastor, while I don't know who's gonna raise my three children, God has promised me that he loves them more than I do. And he's promised me that he's doing all things well. Then she turned to me and she said, Brother Gibbs, isn't God good? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let me have my wish list. Let me have my druthers. Let me have everything going the way I want it to go. For the next five minutes, I never said a word. I'm just leaning over her, listening to her tell me how good God is and how God's met her every need. Finally, her voice is now failing and she said, Brother Gibbs, I don't have much more voice. Could I pray for you? And I've still not said a word. I said, you want to pray for me? She said, yeah. I said, ma'am, I come up here to pray for you. She said, thank you, but my needs are met. Let me pray for you. 
And for the next few minutes, she prayed for me. Finally, she said, I'm so sorry. I got to rest now. I walked out in the hall with the preacher. And I said, Pastor, I feel like a fake. I feel like a phony. I'm telling you, that woman has something I don't have. He said, David, it's called virtue. It's an inner strength, an inner integrity, an inner rightness. And it's commanded by God. And remember, whatever God commands you to add to your faith, he will enable you to add to your faith. You can't do it in your strength. Why would you want to navigate life without the virtue, the strength, the integrity, the honor? Oh, wow. Can I warn you? How many of you have children? Hold your hand up. How many of you know kids are God's little spies? How many of you are aware of that? They're watching. And would my kids say, Dad's a man of virtue. Mom's a mom of virtue. Grandma and Grandpa are people of virtue. Would they say that of you? Oh, listen. It's the first thing God commands. Now look at how he cumulatively then builds. He says, and add to your faith virtue. And then he says, and then to virtue, add knowledge. Uh, circle the word knowledge there. Uh, we use this word. We just don't use it too often this way. We normally use knowledge to mean an assemblance of information. We say, what a knowledgeable mechanic or an a knowledgeable professor. They just know a lot. And by the way, you can know a lot and still be profoundly stupid. How many of y'all have ever met an educated idiot, right? I mean, they're everywhere. Uh, we have a, a lawyer we deal with. If you can imagine, he, he has a law degree, a medical degree, and four earned PhDs. Now, if you're going to play trivia, he's the guy you want on your side. The only problem of it is he doesn't know how to do anything. He'll call and say, I, I need you to tell me what to do, David. You can have knowledge. That's not the scope. That's not the word used here. The word knowledge here was the word for a closeness, for knowing someone. Uh, my wife and I, I'm married now 53 years. I knew her the day I married her, but nothing like I know her today. I know her. That's this word. God says, I want you to know me. I want you to get close. Last week, how close did you get? He says, start with virtue and then add this intimacy. My son Matthew, who's now a pastor in Southern California at the New Life Baptist Church, when he was about, I think, six or seven, Brother Willette, I came home off the road one day, and, and uh, I came in, sat down. I'd been gone a couple of weeks, and Matt spotted me. I'm sitting in this big easy chair, and he came and ran and jumped on me and hugged me, and he said, Dad, 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 I want to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I said, what do you want, Matt? What do you want? Never forget what he said. What do you want, Matt? What do you want? I don't want anything, Dad. I just want to be with you. I just want to talk to you. How would you feel if your kids only came around when they wanted something? And after they got what they wanted, they didn't want you. They just wanted what they could get. I'm afraid sometimes that's how we go to God. When's the last time you went to him just to be with him and spend time with him? The joy of my life is when one of those grandkids climbs up in my, my lap, Brother Willette, and says, I, I just want to be with you, Papa. Hug me. Hug me. Oh, listen. You have a heavenly father. Now it starts with virtue, and then it goes to knowledge. 
Look at the third thing he says, and to knowledge, temperance. Uh, can I encourage you? This is a tough one for me. Temperance means self-control. Uh, how many of you here have ever made a fool of yourself? Hold your hand up, would you? Yeah. Oh, listen. It takes quite a little bit to get me ticked off. It does. But once I'm ticked off, I'm eloquent. I want to say things. And they're not complimentary. And you know what the problem of it is? You break the heart of God when you do that. When I'm out of control, when you're out of control, it breaks God's heart. In our ministry, we deal with a lot of really cantankerous lawyers and politicians who cuss us out regularly. I mean, I, there may be people in their ministry that get cussed at more than us, but I'm not aware of them. And boy, I have to keep reminding myself, stay under control. Don't let them pull your mouth into this. Now, it starts with virtue. And by the way, I don't think you can get under control without virtue. And then it says, add an intimacy, that knowledge. And then to knowledge, temperance. Look at the fourth thing. And then he says, to temperance, add patience. Uh, my simple definition is patience is letting God do what he wants when he wants. He knows the timetable that's right. Now, my problem is I want life on my timetable. God, here's what I want, and here's when I want it. And God says, I want you to leave the timetable in my hands. I know what you need, and I know when you need it. And that's patience. How many here have ever taken a, a road trip with small kids? Hold your hand up, would you? Isn't that a great experience? We there yet? Now, they just asked that question 10 minutes ago, and it's an all-day trip. They, they, they have no patience. And you know what God says? I want you to be comfortable waiting on me. Waiting on the Lord is a command. And it's in the active. It's not a passive command. It's an active command. The word students here can tell you with far more detail what that means. But I'm telling you, I have to remind myself, God, I want your timetable. We get our lawyers down on their knees every day. And we say, God, give us patience. Add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. Whoa. Would anybody watching you get a good view of Jesus Christ? Godliness. It means literally Christ-likeness. Godliness. You say, well, yeah, but Brother Gibbs, that's not realistic. No, you're exactly wrong. Whatever God commands, God enables. You can do these seven things. The Lord's not sitting in heaven this morning saying, yep, boy, that is some list we laid on them. They'll never be able to do that. The way he put that list together, and it's in a command form, and by the way, it's written in the imperative command form, is because he fully expects David Gibbs to do it. He fully expects you to do it. But he says, I want you to be Christ-like, Christ-like. I was witnessing to a judge once, and he says, David, I have a very unique situation. I said, what's that judge, an unsaved man? He said, I've lived in the same house for 30 years. And he said, I've had the same neighbors on all four sides, across the street, in back, right, left, had the same neighbors for 40 years. And he said, all four of my neighbors are what you would call saved, born-again people. And he said, I've watched them for 40 years. 
And he says, it seems to me that what upsets me upsets them. It seems to me when I go to pieces, they go to pieces. And he said, I've been watching. And, and he said, here's my question. Surely your God wants better representatives than that. And that's the word he used. Better representatives than that. I said, Judge, I don't know who your neighbors are. I have no idea. But I said, I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about me. When you watch me, what do you see? When somebody watches you, what do they see? When you pillow your head tonight, are you going to be able to say, for God's glory, to the best of my ability, I left a Christ-like trail today? That's the command. And to godliness, he said, add brotherly kindness. Now, I want to lump the last one with it into brotherly kindness, charity, the word agape, the love of God. I was in a church, beautiful church like this one, and during the altar call, a very elderly lady with a young boy came down to the front, and the people in the church, really a nice church, were, were way out dressed for this dear lady. She was in rags. And when she came forward, she looked up at me and she went like this. And so I went down to talk to her and I said, can I help you? She said, I hope so. She said, Brother Gibbs, this is my grandson. His mom just died from a drug overdose. His father is in prison serving three life sentences for murders he's committed. And the court just gave this boy to me. She said, now I have no money. But she said, I want to raise this boy for God. She said, my husband's last illness took all of our funds. And she said, you can tell this is a really fine church. These are really high class people here. And she said, these were her words. We're poor. We're not fine. And she said, I just wondered if you do a church where we'd fit. I said, I sure do. I said, I'm so glad you asked. I know one. She says, where is it? I said, you're standing in it. Because if you don't fit, I don't fit. If you don't fit, Jesus doesn't fit. Listen, but for the grace of God, that could be you. That could be me. I said, you've got to let these people love you and show you kindness. Boy, did they ever. That boy now, is, if I'm right, is in his third year of Bible college on his way to the mission field. That church adopted that grandmother, that boy. Those are things we're commanded to do. Commanded. Now look at what he says then in verse 8. For if these things, these seven things, be in you and abound. Now, <laughs> that word abound really changes that sentence. You say, well, I got a little of that and a little of that and a little of that. God says, no, 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 no. I want this to abound in David Gibbs. I want this to abound in you. If these things be in you and abound, I love these next words, they make you. Uh, Jim Berg at Bob Jones University wrote a book on this passage. and He called these God's building blocks. That's a great statement. They make you. That you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge. There's that word for intimacy again of the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you ever felt like, boy, I've plateaued a little bit? I don't know that I'm growing as much as I used to. Well, here's the building blocks. But verse 9 is frightening. But he that lacketh these things, it's, say out loud the next word. Blind. Say it again. Blind. 
Now, wait a minute. This is to Christians. God says, if you don't have these seven things, you're blind. Have you ever seen a Christian, you say, can't he see what he's doing to his family? Can't he see what he's doing to the testimony of Christ? Can't he see what he's doing to himself? What he's doing to the church? Probably not, because they're blind. That's by decree of God. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. I was in Thailand. Anybody here ever been to Thailand? Hold your hand up. Any, oh, a number of you. Uh, you want to go if you ever get the chance. Because like nowhere I'm aware of on planet Earth, they drive the craziest in Thailand of anything I've ever seen. I mean, if you like incredibly unbelievable, uncontrolled driving, Thailand's the place to go. Now, it's bad in other places, but Thailand's just a world unto itself. Lines on the road mean nothing. The color of lights mean nothing. A light goes red. That don't do anything. Um, if, if the traffic on your side is stopped, we're on an eight-lane highway. It's not moving on our side. They go drive into the oncoming traffic. I'll never forget, I got in a cab at the airport. First time I was there, we're pulling out. And we whack the car in front of us. Just whack him. I said, hey, you hit him. He said, yeah, he no move, boss. He no move. <laughs> and if the car in front of you doesn't move, they whack him. And you're there about a week, and you, get, you say, yeah, go on, hit him again. Hit him again. See if you can. <laughs> I mean, you just you get with it. And they got these little motorbikes that just buzz everywhere. It's an amazing thing to be in. I'm there helping a missionary. Uh, our ministry helps um, normally about 100 to 150 missionaries a year with their legal problems in foreign lands. And I'm there helping a ministry, and we're on our way to court. I'm in the back seat of a cab. It's chaotic traffic in the morning, uh, a trip that if the traffic weren't there would probably take 10 to 15 minutes, takes two hours. But we have come to where there's an intersection of five roads. Now, they don't do anything like yield to the right. I, I mean, it's just the guy with the nastiest attitude goes first. And oh, horns just honking. You know, the, when I was first there, they said, you understand, to us, if your brakes are broke or your horns broke, you fix the horn. Because brakes don't matter, horns do. And that's how they drive. Well, I'm in the back seat of the car, and we're at this five-road intersection, and it's just chaos. And they hit each other. They scrape their cars up. They hit each other. And over there, pedestrians do not have the right-of-way. Cars do. If you hit a pedestrian, you've done nothing wrong. The first time I was in a cab, and we knocked a pedestrian down, I said, hey, you hit him, you hit him. The cab driver said he should get out of the way. <laughs> I mean, it, it's just so alien to us. Well, we're on our way to court. I'm talking to the missionary there. And out of nowhere, the cab driver screamed. She died. You see, she died. And he yelled so loud, I jumped. I spilled papers. and Finally, I looked. And what he was pointing at was a beautiful Thai teenage girl. I'm going to guess she's 15, 16 years old. But she's blind. She has no eyes. And she's trying to cross that chaos. And she's got her arm out like this. And her head's up like this. She's trying to hear her way through all that pandemonium. I looked up and bang, she got hit. It knocked her down, threw her a distance probably from here to that chair. And I went, oh no, she got hit. 
And that little girl stood back up and pulled her arm in, and the bone was through the skin. And blood was just coming out. And she reached out with the other arm. I went to open my door to go help her. Bang, I hit the car next to me. The missionary did the same. The cab driver's yelling at us, you get out, you'll die too. I thought, dear God, she can't see. She's caught in this chaos. And she's blind. The Bible says, that's me. That's you. Without these seven things, but he that lacketh these things is blind. I don't know what happened to that young girl. I don't know. I just know the vision of her is etched on my mind. Doing everything she could to make it, but blind. With all diligence, add to your faith. Last week's gone. Nobody gets another shot at it. But if God tarries his coming and he gives you the gift of life, next week can be unlike any you've ever lived in your life. You can add to your faith. Just remember, it starts with that inner integrity, that inner rightness, that inner strength, that correctness. It starts with virtue. By the grace of God, he says, I'll help you add to your faith. You have the privilege to be in a church where the word of God is carefully taught. You have the privilege to own a Bible. You realize there's many Christians around the world that there'll be hundreds of them and they share one Bible. How privileged we are. But I remind you, we're called to be doers, not hearers. We're called to be what God wants us to be. With all diligence, add to your faith. Bow your heads. Father, thank you. Thank you for loving us. Oh, this morning... May your word speak to our hearts. Heads are bowed. How many of you say, Brother Gibbs, God's word spoke to my heart this morning. My heart's been touched. If that's true, hold your hand up right now. Hold them up. Father, you see my hand. You see these precious hearts. God, may we purpose now, not just to know this passage, but to do this passage, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children together said, Amen.